ghosts, spirits, souls, um, specters, you name it. All this terminology that we use to talk about these entities, incorporeal entities that come and scare us, that haunt us, that keep appearing all the time. They've been appearing since the beginning of times. This is something that uh, the ghost does. But ghosts can do much more than that. They can tell us about our culture, they can tell us about all the civilizations, and they can voice the repressed and expose injustices. How this is connected with identity is what I'm going to talk to you about today in our video podcast episode 8. From this section in Ice in Gothic Land, you are Gothic but you don't know it, where we are investigating, where we are talking about the ghost as a metaphor that shapes your identity. I want to go deep down today the rabbit hole and look at this sociological role of the ghost. We're going to look at that in literature, we're going to look at that into this soci sociological space and we're going to find out all about the information that the ghost is trying to tell us and it's been trying to tell us since the beginning of times. So come on my friend, let's go press play and keep going because today we have a lot of very important information. Get your pen and paper, get ready. Hello Gothic friend, this is Alice and you are in Gothic Land, a place where we find our true selves. Welcome one more episode, episode number eight, in this space of you are Gothic but you don't know it, where we are talking today about the identity, we continue talking about identity, but today we're talking about the sociological role of ghosts. Normally we will be looking into these aspects from now on from the literary point of view, but you're going to see that we're going to have to step out uh, outside literature to see how everything from the outside comes back into literature. If you remember last week I was giving you a lot of definitions about different terminology uh, connected to ghosts. I was giving you definitions about ghosts, phantoms, spirits, uh, specters and I was doing all that to tell you about the origin of the vocabulary for you to see how we expanded and when it started being a written a written form uh, but I also gave you two examples of representations of the ghost on the one hand I was telling you about the Babylonian tablet that they had been recently found that talks about ghosts and how that showed us how the ghost was, uh, the ghostly was part of the living. And I also was telling you about um, the first time, the, or one of the first times that we have registered information about uh, the Greek uh, theater, Greek drama, and how the ghost wasn't just part of the everyday drama or everyday lives and in fiction, but also they could appear in comedy, if you remember that. If not, if you haven't seen that video, go back to episode seven and watch it because it's got really good content, really good information you're going to love. So today we're going to be looking into the ghost from this sociological point of view. But before we do that, let me remind you that if you're looking to get moving with a, with a, um, a coursework, with a project, I have the right thing for you, my friend. You just have to go to gothicalice.com and there you will see this fantastic download is very very easy, it's just a very simple PDF that it, it tries to create awareness because awareness matters. If you have a plan, you have a project, but it's everything very, very messy in your head, then I can help you with that. And you're going to be thinking, well, what's the ghost got to do with this? How is it connected? Well, we have a lot of ghosts in our heads. We have a lot of dark spaces. And I like investigating all these spaces through the gothic lens. You will see that when you talk to me. But this PDF that I have created uh, has in mind 
um, all these people that are trying to put together a project normally connected to uh, darker spaces but not necessarily and what it does and what it's called is to get all your critical thinking to analyze your life expectations so by doing that you're going to be in charge of all of the areas of your life while building your project because we tend to neglect everything else we concentrate on our project but we keep forgetting about uh, our daily problems our ups and downs our routines everything that in between as well so many people are still missing out so what i'm going to do or what i do when you download this PDF is help you create this awareness by asking you basic questions and then you can become in charge of all the areas of your life by building your project. If you do not believe what I'm saying, you only have to go to my webpage, gothicalis.com, and you're gonna see there a couple of testimonies. There are more, and the more I coach other people in this space, the more you will see that you come to talk to me for an hour and you walk out, you go walk away with a whole month worth um, thinking, working, planning, and you can see changes straight away. Okay, so after I've, I've having done a little bit of advertisement for myself, let's move on with today's topic, which is the sociological role of the ghost. And this is a continuity of episode seven. Uh, so we are doing this little series about ghosts because I think it's super important to keep working on this figure. By working on this figure, eventually we're going to come across other figures like vampires and doppelgangers. We're going to see others. But right now, the ghost for me is essential as a really good example of the Gothic and also how it can interfere in our identity and it can actually help us work on our identity. So you can have a double, double edged sword if you want, but we will be clarifying this as we go along. And I would like to start today's talk with a quote that is actually an abstract. Um, it's an abstract taken from the article first published in November the 12th, uh, the 12th of November 2014, called a social, sorry, a social Anthropology of Ghosts in 21st Century America. I know that uh, it only considers the American uh, ghost, but um, the thing is that a lot of the things that happen in, Amer in America, uh, even though this is in 2014 and now we are in 2022, the thing is that a lot of things have changed and we are a lot more global than then. So we could apply what I'm going to read to you now, this abstract I'm going to read to you can actually apply worldwide even. I would even dare say that because I'm going to read you this abstract and then you're going to see what I mean. I'm not going to go into the whole article first because um, you have to pay to read the whole thing and they tend to be a little bit expensive if you start downloading all, all sorts of abstracts from everywhere. And at the moment, my friend, this is why your coffee page is there, to give me a little bit of, of hand and a bit of help with that. <laughs> Once you donate, I can then pay download uh, these articles that are so interesting for you and for me, for both of us. So when, but with this, in this instance, in this case, just knowing what the abstract says and what it's going to be dealing with is already a sign of uh, what's going on and how we perceive the ghost. But let me just read you the this abstract and then you can make your mind up as well. So this is how it goes. It says, although belief in ghosts or analogous concepts is prevalent cross-culturally, including in contemporary Western cultures, social scientific treatments of spirit belief and experience often dismiss such views as superstitious or overlook this dimension of culture completely. Using mixed methods, we examine ghost belief, experience and media consumption as well as a practice of ghost hunting in the United States. Results from a national survey demonstrate that these beliefs and practices are common and concentrated strongly among, among younger generations of Americans, especially moderately religious doublets. Fieldwork with multiple groups centered on hunting ghosts reveals several notable themes, including rhetorical appeals to both science and religion, magical rites, the extensive use of technology to mediate evidence and experiences of ghosts, and the narrative construction of hauntings. We argue that the internet liminality of spirits, sorry, we argue that the inherent 
liminality of the spirit as cultural constructs accounts for the persistence, power, and continual recurrence. So what we see here is fantastic. I mean, you might need a little bit of time to chew this down a little bit to digest it, but it's actually telling you everything I've been trying to tell you from the beginning, from the beginning of this mini series, which is how present these ghosts still are and what actually tells us about our own cultures and our, about our own societies. And this is what we're going to be talking about. We seem to be having this necessity of demonstrating scientifically the existence of ghosts to validate our beliefs, to validate what we might be able to see, uh, that some people see and some people don't. So there's this necessity as well about uh, this curiosity that we have about the other side, uh, what happens when we die, we'll all be coming, becoming ghosts. And this is the, the next thing that the other that we might become, this is the ghost, the other we might become is this uh, figure that scares us, but at the same time, that's who we were before or we can become them. So we have here this otherness aspect of the Gothic uh, that is very interesting to work on. But also we see the uncanny. And if you remember, the uncanny is this sensation of what is familiar becoming unfamiliar, is this strangeness that we we have depending on, on what we have in front of us. So this is something that the ghost keeps doing over and over. And this is precisely what, what takes me to the next point. I didn't want to start talking about this book. I didn't want to start talking about medieval ghost stories before actually going into the first part of the book, which is a quote that started off everything that I'm doing right now with the ghost. And that says the following. The ghost is not simply a dead or missing person, but a social figure and investigating it can lead to that then side where history and subjectivity make social life. Now, this is a quote by, I always forget the name, uh, Avery F. Gordon. And this is, have been, this is the phrase that has been in my head since I first read this book. Now, this book was written by Andrew Joins in 2006. Well, in fact, it was first published in 2001 and then it was reprinted in 2006. And because of this quote that we have here, uh, I mean, Avery F. Gordon, she wrote, this, this quote is taken from the book, Ghostly Matters, Haunting and the Sociological Imagination, and it's from Minneapolis, the University of Minnesota Press, 1997. So you can see how long the ghost thing has been also been investigated academically and for other purposes, like to find out at what point the message of the ghost is important and what we can learn culturally and sociologically. So what I did to satisfy my curiosity was to pull, to follow the, the string again and see where this quote was taken from. So I went to the original book, this book that I've just told you about, uh, Ghostly Matters, and what I found there is that in the, in the foreword, written by Janice Radway, we have a quote that for me is super important that we now read and is the following. Uh, for Radway, Gordon seeks in a new way of knowing that is more a listening than a seeing, a practice of being uh, attuned to the echoes and murmurs of that which has been lost, but which is still present among us in the form of intimations, hints, suggestions and portents. She terms these echoes and murmurs ghostly matters and she suggests that they haunt us at every turn. But Radway also in these preliminaries, in this foreword, she also mentions another uh, investigator, another teacher, and that is uh, Christine Berthin. And Christine Berthin, uh, she's taught Gothic and uh, Romantic Fiction at the UCSC and at the University of Orleans. And she has also published extensively on P.B. Shelley, Mary Shelley, Kids and the British Gothic Tradition. And she also has a book called The Gothic Hauntings, Melancholy Crips and Textual Ghosts. 
So again, another very expensive book to buy, but my friend, you can find some extra information from other books and put things together a little bit. But the idea will be to buy the whole book if you are interested or, you know, Kindle. Um, so in this book, she says the following, and it's all connected to this initial quote that I read to you before. So she says, while ghosts have been explained away, spectrality has become a major trope of our culture and our cultural discourses. It hovers at the crossroads between literature, psychoanalysis, and critical thinking as the crux of our modernity. Ghosts have become theoretical objects. Well, as you can imagine, I'm over the moon with this paragraph because it has everything that I am all about. I'm all about critical thinking is what I always tell you about. Critical thinking, I'm telling you about psychology. We look at the literature, side of things, the literary side of things, but we also look into everything from a sociological point of view. How does it all fit in our lives, in our everyday lives? And this is so, so important. That's why I really love this quote. And at this point, now you're going to realize why it was so important that last week as I gave you all those definitions that I was giving you on ghost spectre, spectre because what we have now and on the others, yeah, phantom, etc. Because now we have the concept here of spectre that comes up again, but we also have subjectivity. So it's super important that now with the next quote I'm going to read to you, everything is going to start making sense. And everything that I told you about the Babylonian tablet and the Greek uh, drama and the future ghosts that we're going to see, and all the ghosts that you probably have in your head now while thinking about, while you're listening to me, is all going to make a lot more sense. So whereas we are still doubting between the ghost being something that is in our head, so we have a psychological aspect there that we can't forget about, whereas it's, it's as I said, it's, it's subjective or is something that our senses uh, can perceive, but maybe our senses are lying to us, we somehow, we try to objectivize these ghosts. We try to give it some credibility. So we give this discourse, we give it this argument. So what we're trying to do is to objectivize these ghosts. And by objectivizing the ghost, what we are actually doing is somehow make it physical, make it more real. If things are more real, then we seem to be able to cope better with them and to talk about them and define them. And in defining this ghost, we are going back to identity. You see, everything goes in a big circle and it all comes back to the same point. Another thing that Radway tells us about Gordon is the following, and it's what you have in the next quote. She says that for Gordon, subjectivity is always an ine inevitably haunted by the social and most especially by those representations, disappearances, absences and losses enforced by the conditions of modern life. Because the ghost is not just that ghost that you're thinking about, the ghost that we see in stories, the, the ghost that is a, a deceased person that is haunting us or that gives us information. It also refers to this ghostling, which is the fact of quieting quieting in voices and don't mention all those things that people do to other people and that we censor so they don't get seen. All that is also a big ghost, is a social ghost and we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot just quieten it and we can just ignore it because it's there haunting us. It's also the remorse of our actions. So it's super important. You see that the ghost has got a lot of legs and it's going to start spreading out into many other readings. And this is what we're going to keep doing. So this is spectrality I was talking to you about is what I'm going to talk to you now uh, with an example. I'm going to use um, Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, for you to see how this spectrality works in a text. And for that, I'm going to give you again, I'm going to give you a couple of pieces of information, two points of view that are very, very valuable. So for those who are not familiarized with Hamlet, Hamlet has been made into films, series and plays. You can see it all over the place. But if you're not familiarized, you can just Google that and you will see a lot of information. And as I said, you, you can have access to the films as well and the different adaptations. So and the story of Hamlet, very, very brief and very taking, you know, with, take this not with a bit of salt, but 
very simplified <laughs> in a simplified way what you have with hamlet is that hamlet is this this heir of a throne and his dad is dead has just died his mother has just married uh, his uncle so her father's brother and all of a sudden the ghost of the father comes back and in coming back it tells hamlet to take revenge because he says I've, i'm here in the limbo you know I'm, i've got a few days to stay here i'm in pain because i shouldn't have died i've been murdered okay boom so hamlet is you can imagine he's got something to do now he has a um, he has a task he has a purpose the purpose is um, that he needs to find out really confront his uncle and his mom to see really if if he was murdered but with hamlet what we have is this doubt of whether this ghost is actually a genuine ghost and is not some kind of evil spirit trying to con and make a mess of uh, hamlet's life if he's his oedipus complex that he really wants to be with his mom but he's he's got this awkward way of showing it up and at that time it wasn't the right thing to be doing um or talking about even or, or if really really his uncle is this evil thing that really killed his own brother and hamlet is trying to get revenge but in the process he's driving everybody mad so what we see here in this information the main thing the story on the surface on the one hand is this ghost that is looking for revenge that is seeking for revenge and hamlet is trying to do to fulfill his role as a son as a good son but on the other hand what we have here is that um we can see the mentality of the 16th century and this is very important this is what the text makes us um consider and makes us go to that in the 16th century the mentality regarding the role that each man and women had in at the time it's very important and it's what i'm going to be analyzing next so how men and women fitted in this whole system this is what i'm going to read to you now and this is based on uh, the foreword again in this book right so in this book that i have here this is my version of hamlet okay it's it's um normally i buy penguins but this is every man i bought it quite a while ago and in the notes that we have here uh, we can read uh, the following and the fragment is by Derek Jacobi. So Derek Jacobi uh, writes a long analysis about Hamlet. Also, there are lots of notes because it's a very difficult text if you read it in the original original English. And so it's a this one is um is actually got notes and explanations because it is pretty challenging. Look how old it is, it's super yellow. And this is how the fragments or a couple of fragments read uh, in regards of what we're talking about today. So the first fragment goes like this. It says, the average Elizabethan lived in a world in which the fundamental assumption was that of hierarchical order. There was a cosmological hierarchy, a political and social hierarchy, and a psychological hierarchy. And each was a reflection of the others. I mean, this is absolutely mind-blowing but then we have the next quote that goes as follows it says copernicus had questioned the cosmological order machiavelli had questioned the politi political order and montaigne had questioned the natural order so this is what happens when this order is broken that then everybody questions everything and everything needs to be analyzed and then the world is not what it seems and then we have a ghost that is trying co to communicate something and we're not actually sure if this ghost right now considering all these elements has to be read as just a simple ghost that is trying to find a uh, revenge it's actually a lot more it's telling us a lot more things and this is my friend the role of the ghost what we're going to be continuing we're going to co continue analyzing in the next few days because for now I think that you've got enough to think about, but uh, there are some takeaways from this session, from this video, and this is what you have learned with today's video. I'm just going to tell you the quick points right now. What we've done with this is to create awareness, as always. We've created this awareness regarding what the ghost means in our societies, and, and um, now we're moving into the medieval times right which is exactly what uh, joins does but we're going to be going back at some point on the origin 
of all the monsters to see how they all live together. But for today, what it means to us, and this is how the book starts, Medieval Ghost Stories starts. Also, um, I mentioned a few people, three women, that's just coincidence, that talk about the ghost as a sociological um, entity or the sociological role of the ghost. And that was Christine Berthin, it was Avery F. Gordon, and it was also um, Janice Radway, okay? So this is super, super important. Also, point three is that um, if you notice, I have used all those references to give you an example to actually take you to Hamlet, to a common book, a story that most people know about, and then you can actually picture uh, everything that was going on in that film. It was confusing, uh, sometimes it was a bit slow, and it's exactly because Hamlet is this confused being that doesn't even know who he is anymore because of the message that his dead father, the ghost of his father, is giving him. So now we have here that the identity is a problem for Hamlet because he doesn't know where he stands. He doesn't know who these people are, his mom and his uncle, who they are, and he questions a lot of things around him. So this is where identity comes to play. So my friends, this is it for today. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope that you have found this super interesting. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, comment below and follow me because when you do all those things, you are helping me immensely. If you like this content, the least you can do is share it and do all these other things. I know I'm a bit annoying with this, but uh, other people have marketing and I have to be my own marketing. So there you go. Now, now, seriously, thank you for being here. Also, you can follow me in other platforms if you like the content. In other platforms, I do other things. Like, for example, if you like reading, you can find me on Medium. You can find me on Coffee where I'm trying to do a little bit of workshop with my own fiction. Twitter, I do my daily thoughts. Facebook, I do longer posts, obviously, because on Facebook you can do a lot of more, more things. And Instagram, I'm not so much because it's more about pictures and I'm not really into that kind of thing. But every so often, I do a little bit of posting in there as well. And uh, remember that you can download my free PDF where I'm going to help you with your critical thinking and your life expectations. It's not long, it's a PDF that is going to help you to figure out the questions, the why, the what, the everything, the critical thinking that takes into account all the aspects in your life, not just your project or your project. This project could be a, a book, it could be a presentation, it could be a, a, a business, it could be communication problems, anything of the sort, then I can help you find this clarity. But if you're not sure who I am and if this is the first time you come to this video, this is the first time you see me, I'm Alice and as I said before, I help people with their projects. So I am a bit the light at the end of the tunnel. I can guide you through all the shadows because we have this gothic lens that helps us see and detect where the problems can be. But also because since I'm myself a writer, a confidence builder and a project auditor, I can sell you, sell products to advertise your book, to be more consistent with your social media, to see how I can actually help you with your presentations. Sometimes it's just a little bit of being a bit confident and uh, you have to prepare lessons or anything, your PhDs, whatever you need. I'll be here because I'll be helping you to find all your pain points and go really in depth with that again. Clarity and confidence uh, in all you have to do is go to gothicalis.com where I'm actually updating a lot of the information so everything is super easy to find for you. So go there, have a look and support me in coffee if you remember and if not just go to my email list go and download everything that you like and then every week you will receive my emails and from then on we can take it. If you want a call with me, you can also book that. It's a free assessment call and then we can talk, talk and see how I can actually help you with your project. So my friends, this is it for another week for episode eight. I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope that now you don't see ghosts the same way as you did before. And if you haven't seen the other episodes, go back there, episode five, six and seven and start watching those and then it all will make a lot more sense. So have a nice week. Have a nice weekend until next Friday. Uh, enjoy it and be super, super gothic. Bye-bye.